Hello, and welcome to The Green Pill. I'm Kevin Wacky, and this is the podcast about public goods and regenerative crypto economics. Today, we've got Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum and a research scientist at the Ethereum Foundation on the episode. Obviously, Vitalik's influence on the space is massive, having delivered the original white paper for Ethereum and being the visionary behind the Ethereum network. And one of the things that I wanted to do on this episode was dig in on why Vitalik cares so much about public goods. I think there's like counterfactual world out there in which, say, Vitalik wasn't into public goods as much as he was. And I think that the Ethereum community would be missing some of its vibrancy and community-centric nature that it has these days because Vitalik's champion, uh, because Vitalik has been championing public goods, we don't have that world. So really wanted to dig in on how he views public goods, why public goods are good, and which experiments in the community he thinks about having the most promise for funding public goods and the gestalt of all of those things together. Obviously, Vitalik, uh, beyond just being a champion of the Ethereum ecosystem, also wrote the quadratic funding white paper with Glenn Weil. As you all know, quadratic funding is a foundational part of Gitcoin. And uh, I think that there's a lot of interesting surface area between Gitcoin, the implementation of quadratic funding, and the research that Vitalik and Glenn have done on quadratic funding. So this was a, a fun episode for me. I hope that you enjoy this episode with Vitalik Buterin, founder of Ethereum. Enjoy. Alchemix is a DeFi app that offers self-repaying loans that lets you spend money and save money at the same time. Alchemix allows you to deposit the DAI stablecoin into its vaults, which earns some of the highest yields that DeFi has to offer. You can then take a loan from Alchemix of up to 50% of the deposited DAI, and that loan automatically pays itself back from the yield that is generated from your deposit. It's a savings account that the banks don't want you to know about. Alchemix also has ETH vaults available, so you can get a self-repaying loan that's denominated in ETH. Coming up in Alchemix V2 is a bunch of cool new features such as credit delegation, multi-chain expansion, and DAO revenue sharing and vote boosting. Alchemix lets you get your interest payments on your deposits paid to you upfront. Check out the power of Alchemix at alchemix.fi and make sure to join their extremely vibrant Discord if you want to participate in governance or have any questions about the project. Bankless is proud to be sponsored by Uniswap. Uniswap is a new paradigm in asset exchange infrastructure. Instead of a cumbersome order book system where trades are matched with other humans, Uniswap is an autonomous piece of software on Ethereum that lets you trade any token at the current market price. No human counterparties or centralized intermediaries, just autonomous code on Ethereum. Input the token you want to sell and receive the token you want to buy. The Uniswap Grants Program is accepting applications for grants. Do you have something of value that you think you want to contribute to the Uniswap ecosystem? No matter how big or small your idea is, you can apply for a uni grant at uniswapgrants.org and help steer Uniswap in the direction that you think it should go. Thank you, Uniswap, for sponsoring Bankless. All right, welcome to the show. I am here with Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum and research scientist at the Ethereum Foundation. Welcome, Vitalik. Um, thank you, Kevin. It's good to be here. Great to have you. Vitalik, your background and how you came to found Ethereum is well documented in the Infinite Machine book and elsewhere. So in this space, I want to focus on your advocacy for public goods and your talk, Things That Matter Outside of DeFi, that you gave at ETHCC this year. Um, I think that the natural starting place for me and you to start talking about these themes is quadratic funding. Gitcoin Grants is built off of the research paper you did with Glenn Weil on quadratic funding. Uh, how did you come to conceive of quadratic funding with Glenn, and how do you see it evolving in the future? Mm, I mean, I guess uh, well, Glenn originally came up with the uh, idea for quadratic voting, um, and uh, he, that well, he was one of the people who came up with that idea. Actually, um, there were mm -hmm. uh, it turned it later turned out that there were a whole bunch of uh, historical papers that pointed to uh, very mm -hmm. similar ideas, which. Uh, like actually happens really often for the uh, for, for for the best ideas. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, one from I think nineteen eighty um, talking about why quadratic voting is like the uh, theoretically optimal voting rule. Mm -hmm. There's a whole um, there might be a couple of other ones. Um, but Glenn made kind of the best and most detailed exposition in um, I think it was a paper that he yeah, published like sometime between five and ten years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and quadratic funding was. Uh, an adaptation of the ideas behind quadratic voting to the context of uh, public goods. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I think one of the really big differences between quadratic voting and uh, quadratic funding is that in quadratic voting, the uh, the number the issues that are being voted on are still fixed, and you still need someone to choose what the issues are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it turns out that there is actually a lot of power in being the uh, issue setter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, just like basically, yeah, like if you are a majority that cares about something um, less and than some minority and you want to like, beat out the minority, what right. you can often do is you can just like raise that the same issue like, in the different forms a huge number of times and just like basically drain the other side's voting credits. Um, so quadratic funding is a bit different in that it's kind of fully self like uh, a complete system in that even the choice of questions is uh, not something that needs to be kind of enshrined or like pre pre mined or whatever word you want to use for that, right? Right. Like uh, anyone can create a project, anyone can contribute to a project, and based on the quadratic funding formula and based on how many people donate and how much, the the projects get matched. Um, so this uh, idea that like even like what questions people are deciding on so in this case like which public uh, goods to give money to is also an emergent uh, part of the mechanism is mm-hmm. uh, something that's really powerful um so Glenn and I yeah, wrote the yeah, initial paper. Um, I yeah, also came up with a yeah, modified version called a pairwise uh, a bounded a quadratic funding which uh, just uh, works a bit uh, is a bit more robust against um, collusion and against attackers uh, like uh, controlling a small number of accounts um and right i guess quadratic voting and funding have just gone from there right of course well that's um i mean for me having built gitcoin with the mission of growing and sustaining open source software and having that be a primary focus for us uh and then launching gitcoin grants which use quadratic funding as the foundation uh, it's it's amazing to hear about the history, the back history of how we got here. I'm wondering uh, I'm wondering how you see quadratic funding evolving from here. Quadratic funding on Gitcoin, we're using pairwise as a way of preventing collusion on the mechanism. I know that there's other projects out there that are doing really great stuff like CLR Fund that are using Macy on the mechanism. Do you envision future iteration on the mechanism or is it just kind of down to solving civil resistance uh, or other other adjacent problems? with quadratic funding. I could see some of both, um, but like what modifications there would be to the mechanism. It's uh, like, I do feel like we need to keep an open mind. Like I, I can't think of any that um, we would apply right now, except maybe like tweaking the pair, um, the pairwise matching uh, coefficient. And um, mm-hmm. like one possible direction would be to um, try to go further in the uh, direction of um, like trying to identify um, like which which projects have uh, a support from the same group of people and which projects have really diverse support like pairwise matching already does some of that but you can but you could try to look I guess push even harder in that direction um, another uh, direction is obviously to uh, like, go back to exploring this question of uh, negative votes at some point, Mm -hmm. um, which is, I mean, obviously super controversial, but like on the other hand, there are, I do think that there's a risk that there are some things that will just, that like there needs to be some kind of negative feedback responding to where like, especially if, um, you know, Bankless DAO or Gitcoin or whoever like starts really good, like getting into media, like there are, you know, there is such a thing as like media that that just actually reduces the quality of uh, public discourse. Right. Uh, so, yeah, but that's like the first time it was tried in round five, five you know, there was a lot of uh, controversy for um, obviously. Um, and so that's the sort of thing that would be good to try carefully. Um, but uh, like that, so, you know, like it could even be like very different mechanisms for doing positive and doing negative. It's possible that anything negative would just require much more privacy. Um, mm-hmm. So that's one of those uh, areas that probably should kind of keep being experimented in slowly and carefully at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, aside from that, I yeah, would say, yeah, obviously civil resistance, um, obviously privacy with Macy. Um, uh, it's, 
Yeah, I mean, otherwise it's just a bunch of small tweaks. So, like, I actually right. think uh, keeping the mechanism relatively simple and keeping the tweaks low is the right uh, is the right thing to do. Like, it just, uh, you know, it builds more confidence. That kind of sets the precedent that uh, the mechanism is what it is. Um, right. So, Amazing. Yeah. Well, um, it's great to hear sort of that purview from the author of the quadratic funding paper. Uh, one thing I wanted to run by you is that uh, we're actually having a little bit of a hard time scaling the pairwise mechanism at Gitcoin right now because we're doing 700,000 contributions per quarter. And with pairwise, mm. you have to pairwise bond each contributor to each contributor. Wait, and- 700,000 contributions. How many contributors? I think it's on the order of like 30,000. I'll have to double check. But but yeah, it, it, it would scale uh, exponentially, I think, with the size okay. of the contributor set. And Quadratically, it should be. Yeah. Right? So, um, well, 30,000 looking- by 30,000, that's still 900 million. Like, that seems like the sort of thing that, like, maybe you'll have to write it in, like, C instead of Python. Um, but, or, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. We'll try and think if there are, like, algorithmic tweaks. Um, Totally. Yeah, we're looking for. I think instead of n squared, like log log n or or linear would be great. But uh, yeah, C plus plus or maybe moving mm-hmm. it to a GPU in memory or something like that is is something that we'll be exploring in upcoming. Well, rounds. I mean, I think uh, the you know, other thing is that eventually, like like with Macy, all of this stuff is going to have to be synarched, um, and mm. so the efficiency will kind of go back down. Um, so I do think that there is room for algorithmic tweaks of some kinds, but. No, th- th- this is a yeah, a good intellectual prompt. I will uh, think about this more. Great. Well, I just found the exact number. It's twenty seven thousand contributions or con- contributors in Gitcoin grants round twelve. Mm-hmm. So amazing. Or- okay, so you have a yeah, a lovely twenty seven thousand by twenty seven thousand matrix with seven hundred twenty nine <laughs> million entries, almost all of which are zeros. Yeah. <sighs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, recording this for a broad audience, but to the engineers on the Gitcoin team who are trying to scale that, uh, I'm sure they'll feel seen that we that we uh, talked about this very briefly. <laughs> uh, mm. We'd love to would love to zoom out and um, go from quadratic funding, which is I think where you and I have the most in common, to the entire set of areas where where crypto uh, and Web three can be used for good and for public good. So I guess I want to know. Um, since I've been following you, Vitalik, and since I've seen your talk about about uh, crypto, you've talked a lot about public goods. I think as long as I've as I've as I've been reading your writing, so I want to know how did you get green pilled? What got you into public goods? Mm. Um, I think uh, it was just uh, looking at the yeah, crypto space long enough and seeing um, that. Like there's basically these two big uh, problems in the yeah, crypto space. That where one of them mm-hmm. is that a lot of things that are public goods like re- really do get underfunded, and you see these crazy imbalances where there's uh, projects right. that are spending hundreds of millions or billions of dollars on security or liquidity mining or whatever, but then like they can't re- uh, um, grab together you know a few million to pay for some research or development. Um, and then the other thing is that often when proper public goods don't get funded, what happens is that the market comes up with uh, centralized uh, substitutes um, and you, know, like you basically create an ecosystem that like, actually becomes much more uh, much more centralized than it needs to be. Um, even open source software is a good example of this, right? Like the open source stuff is uh, a public good um, and so it's uh, more difficult to come up with the incentives to contribute to it. Uh, but then if Gener- often what happens is that someone just creates a yes software package that like works halfway but it's be- but it's because it's closed source and so it has a business model to actually keep uh, paying developers and trying to come up with a yeah, better solution to those problems uh, was uh, definitely something that I uh, have been always uh, or at least for a long time fairly passionate about um, another way to look at this is that I've been like really interested in this concept of uh, DAOs um, and I guess uh, DAC. Well, they were called DACs before. I called them DAOs to be more general. Um, decentralized autonomous corporations or organizations, and, and figuring out how to actually do decentralized governance, like what sane decentralized governance mechanisms would look like. And it just so happens that like public funding public goods is like one of the most important um, go- governance uh, problems, or at least one of the most important things that any sane governance mechanism would inevitably end up doing. And so to some extent, they just end up being the same problem. So, I mean, it's amazing to hear from you the example of open source software, because that's why I founded Gitcoin was to grow and sustain open source software. 
Um, and I think that these the underfunding of our digital infrastructure leads to these systemic imbalances between people who can create value and the, those who can capture value. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, what do you think the end game is for crypto and public goods? Like, do you think it's possible that we'll do a better job of funding the underfunded public goods in the Ethereum ecosystem? And what would have to be true to expand that out to all digital public goods or maybe all public goods in the world using mechanisms that have been innovated in crypto? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I do think that like more going out further into more and more digital public goods is important. Um I guess the two main challenges that you're going to have, um, one of them is like scalability. I mean, actually, yeah, I forget. It's like the new, like the D grants, was it on Polygon right now? Or, um, yeah, it can do, deploy to any EVM yeah. compatible network, but it's on Polygon. Right, deploy yeah. to any EVM compatible, right. But like basically, I think even the, the layer two is doing needs to like keep getting cheaper right. um, and keep getting more scalable uh, before, because like the crypto space, I think, is. Uh, you know, made up of uh, fairly wealthy people who um, are mm -hmm. uh, fairly comfortable paying uh, transaction fees that are uh, uh, quite high by most uh, normal people standards, but people outside the ecosystem are not. A and like, I personally do actually believe that like doing the Macy thing and actually sticking kind of the encrypted record of the votes on chain is uh, something that's uh, really valuable. Um, it really uh, improves the uh, security properties of the whole system, mm -hmm. but. Um, it you know like it needs to actually just uh, be made uh, to be made technically sustainable, right? Uh, and then the other issue um, would probably be uh, um, let's see. Well, one is just that people outside the Ethereum ecosystem are less familiar with quadratic funding, and the other big one is um, that um, blockchains have um, like very yeah. Uh, these very big pools of money that are almost like seeking for a credibly neutral way to deploy them. Right. Right. Like it's uh, like for a big project, it's uh, easy to come up with a, yeah, and a, a half a billion dollars. And um, it's uh, harder to right. come up with a mechanism for, for figuring out how to spend it that the uh, community would actually accept. Mm -hmm. And that's not a problem that like that's not the problem that most people have, right? Like most people like don't even have the way of getting half a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, like, I guess uh, governments like um, like have uh, lo local taxation and all of the um, and um, all of those things. Um, though even there, like uh, you know, you'll have to get pretty far before people are going to be willing to experiment on the same scale as I think even the Ethereum ecosystem itself is willing to experiment. Uh, but maybe it can happen. I mean, if it, if it does happen, then great. Uh, there, and then ecosystems that like don't have uh, either a cryptocurrency or a government behind them, like uh, mm -hmm. some, uh, like, like a non cryptocurrency um, open source software package. Like there's this question of, I um, you know, where does, where does the funding coming from? And uh Realistically, you'll ha like if that's the big problem, then the way you'll have to end up compromising is by finding uh, funders who, uh, uh, or the fu the the most eager funders you'll find are funders that have um a strong opinions about what should be funded, and and so the yeah, quadratic uh, kind of everyone contributes to deciding thing that like uh, would not get a chance to shine as much, um so though like those would be the worries that I predict, um but. At the same time, I I do think that there is a lot of promise, um, and mm -hmm. uh, I, so you know, I'm strongly yeah, support any yeah, efforts to keep expanding. And ultimately, like the only thing, the only way this thing ever succeeds is by just like basically powering through the issues. And like some of it might take one or two one or two more years of uh, working on the technology or working on the mm -hmm. memes, but like that's fine, you know. Like the the U.S. is uh, in a yeah, 225 year old uh, constitutional framework so uh, sometimes uh, these kinds of things take time um right did i say 225 year old i meant 245 year old wow uh, um, <laughs> yep hmm. yeah a lot of uh mm -hmm. experimentation and iteration and evolution uh over that time frame over the years and 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 that actually is like a good segue into my next question which is you know, how do you see uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem, we talk a lot about client diversity, which is making sure that the base layer clients that are going to power the network once we move to proof of stake 
are diverse in implementation, which prevents any sort of fault in the network if one of the clients has a bug in it um, or a security hole. And I'm wondering how you think about pluralism of mechanism and of implementation when it comes to the public goods stack. Over the last year, you've been talking to the Optimism team about retroactive public goods funding, which uh, I think is an amazingly complementary mechanism to what Gitcoin Grants is doing. And uh, within the quadratic funding ecosystem, there's obviously Gitcoin, there's CLR funds, and uh, uh, and you get a, an amount of diversity in the public goods funding stack from that. And there's also other intersubjective consensus tools that are starting to be built in DAOs like Coordinate that are meant to help uh, build mechanisms for how you fund your contributors to a DAO. I'm wondering how you think about pluralism of mechanism and of implementation in the public goods funding stack for the Ethereum ecosystem. And how does that relate to the client diversity and the pluralism of ETH clients that we want to have in ETH post ETH2? So how do you think about pluralism generally and in those two sub subject matters? Actually, like there, there's two different kind of, like types of uh, contexts where uh, pluralism mm -hmm. is important, right? Like one of those contexts is where something that's too powerful going wrong uh, can cause a lot of problems, and the so the thing like the thing that you're risking from not having having pluralism, like basically just is like this kind of this this downside risk from one thing being too powerful, and then the other situation is where your risk is missing uh, uh, out on an opportunity to do something right. right? And I think uh, a lot of public goods funding, especially in the software space, are a lot of the second, right? Like it's uh, often much less bad to waste uh, $10 million on funding uh, the wrong thing than it is to miss out on uh, spending $10 million on something that turns out to be quite important. Mm -hmm. And so... Mm, like that is a yeah, like a really big argument for for uh, pluralism as well, right? Um, so I guess uh, in the sec like that's which is exactly why like I uh, support there being many different kinds of mechanisms, right? Like you know you have uh, Gitcoin grants with its quadratic funding, you'll have Optimism retro funding, um, you know we can have Uniswap DAO and some various other DAOs, a couple of centralized organizations um, that are led by. Um, you know, hopefully high quality leaders that are trying to execute on their own coherent visions. And really, we, we as an ecosystem only need like one of them to uh, kind of be right um, in order to get the important stuff covered. Mm -hmm. um, so that's um, so that's one way or one of the kind of reasons why I think it's important. And then the other thing, the reason why it's important, this is about um, kind of creating the more diversity in order to prevent like this risk of what happens if uh, you know what one client uh, gets too powerful and um, that's uh, obviously in the case of ETH of uh, ETH2 clients uh, that's uh, mm -hmm. a, bi a really big deal or I guess sorry they're consensus layer clients and uh, execution layer clients right um, it, it's a big deal uh, because uh, you know if you have prism that has more than two thirds and if prism is wrong they could just immediately finalize a block that's wrong mm -hmm. and that's going to be really hard for the ecosystem to get uh, away from mm -hmm. and then another example of this might also be like political balance of power um right because uh, like if there is uh, mm -hmm. one very concentrated political elite that has a lot of power in like figuring out how like how a protocol moves forward or even, um, or even has like a lot of veto power, um, then that ends up kind of really yeah, constraining things and constraining the protocol's uh, ability to evolve in a different vision or recover from the possibility that that group of people is wrong. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so both of the yeah both of those are just uh, really important to um, keep in mind and and uh, and really important to foster. So, you know, I'm happy that we have all of these ETH2 clients and that mm -hmm. there's this big movement to try to get like people and uh, not just people, also applications like things like Dapnode that a lot of seekers to rely on it to uh, support all of them. Right. Um, and then obviously the uh, more distributed public goods funding efforts. I, uh, I feel like they have uh, improved things in the Ethereum space uh, quite a bit already, mm -hmm. right? Like even, you know, bank bankless uh, was a, uh, major early recipient of uh, Gitcoin grants right. funding. Yeah, so, you know, we need both. We need uh, a, a lot of this kind of public pluralism. Right. Amazing. 
Yeah, I'm wondering, other than the mechanisms that I mentioned, uh, which just to refresh the audience's memory, were retroactive public goods funding, coordinate CLR fund, Gitcoin grants, quadratic funding. What other mechanisms are you excited about and do you think are underexplored for funding public goods, if any? One of the um, ideas for public goods funding that does not depend on a uh, central funds allocator that mm-hmm. I've tried to push on a couple of occasions mm-hmm. is like actually doing a better job of having like, using NFTs to fund public goods. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, like uh, we uh, like so far, it feels like um, you know we have these really expensive uh, NFTs that uh, often support things that like are often actually interesting and fun. Uh, mm-hmm. But it would be cool if uh, we have the get NFTs that support things that are interesting and fun, but also meaningful. Um, mm. There is, a, I think there, like the, there, the model that I had uh, supported um, back when I wrote that post on legitimacy a while back, right, was this idea that you could have NFTs that were kind of a, uh, an artist partnering with a charity where the artist kind of provides the art to the charity and uh, pr- provides some legitimacy mm-hmm. and uh, the revenues end up uh, end up being split between the two. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the NFT becomes kind of both art and a way to like show that you care about a particular charity. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that um, OptiPunks, right? It's like a spinoff of CryptoPunks for Optimism. I saw that they were spent... Like, putting some of the revenues from selling the punks into the yeah, the retro yep. funding pool or something like that. Yep, that's um, right. They did, they did fund around so, and we're very thankful for that. Um, and we've also been experimenting with this mm-hmm. project called Moonshot Bots at Gitcoin DAO, which is uh, mm-hmm. an NFT where all of the sales of the primary sale went to public goods and then worked with Nouns DAO on releasing an NFT that was for public goods. So actually Gitcoins have been kind of experimenting with fundraising in, in this category uh, a little bit. So it's interesting to hear you say that, especially with the explosive growth of NFTs in 2021. Well, it makes me really happy to hear. Great. Well, yeah, we're always, um, you know, I say that quadratic funding is just this really amazing, elegant mechanism, but the two kind of catches that come along with it are solving the civil inclusion problem, which is somewhat complex, and then also the continual need to fund a matching pool are just like the two kind of like adjacent things that you need to do in order to keep that steam engine of quadratic funding rolling. And um, you've traditionally been sort of an advocate for let's not spend too much money in each round and let's make sure that the community knows that there's that continuous quadratic funding that's going to happen over time so that they can start to expect it and adjust their behavior to work more on public goods from there. So um, I'm wondering if you think I got those two mechanisms those two sort of like catches right with quadratic funding. It's the ability to uh, innovate on how you fund the matching pool and the ability to innovate on on fraud detection. Is there anything else uh, that you would include in that category of of like quadratic funding adjacent uh, implementation problems? Quadratic, let's see. Uh, those are probably the big ones, right? Mm. Um, yeah, like there's uh, the kind of making sure the mech what category one is uh, making sure the mechanism is sound, which would yeah. include co- um, collusion resistance, civil resistance, like the cryptography, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is uh, finding funding sources. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do want to wondering yeah, whether or not. Mm-hmm. Oh, if you if if you don't have anything to add there, I, I was gonna sort of pull on the thread of civil resistance, and um, I know that you recently spent some time in Argentina with Santi. We talked about that in his episode a little bit. Proof of humanity, I think, is an amazing protocol for creating civil resistance on the Ethereum ecosystem. And I'm and I'm wondering what you think the ecosystem, what kind of new mechanisms the ecosystem could invent once civil resistance has proliferated across the ecosystem. So basically moving from one token, one vote DAOs, or, which I know you've said one-to-one coin voting can be plutocratic, to more one human, one vote type systems. How excited are you for civil resistance to be widely available and what kind of new mechanisms do you think that will enable in the ecosystem? Lots of things in governance, uh, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, in other, aside the main non-governance use case um, that I think is important for crypto has to do with coin distribution. Um, I think that mm. there is uh, right now, uh, you know, obviously there are airdrops, um, but also there's uh, 
a bit of a uh, backlash against airdrops for a couple of reasons. So like one is that they don't discriminate between mm. people who like, actually care a lot about a project and people who like barely care at all. Um, and like that's not mm-hmm. like that won't be solved with um, like proof of personhood. That might require some other solutions. Like I'm uh, increasingly a fan of the uh, learn to earn stuff. Um, and, like, as a substitute mm. for just like unconditionally giving people coins. Mm. Um, the other one, is, but then the other problem is that they just get farmed to death by uh, VC funds and like whatever airdrop mechanism someone comes up with, it can basically only safely be used once. Mm-hmm. And like, that's a problem, right? Um, so uh, I think uh, like having airdrops that are gated by proof of personhood is uh, something that uh, could really uh, help and uh, improve things. And like, it could even be a hybrid, right? It could even be like the number of coins you get is the square root of how, mo- of how many dollars of liquidity you contributed. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, more things like that, um, I uh, think could help projects a lot because I do think that there is a very genuine desire to have a, a very wide distribution, but at this end, at the same time, a very genuine desire to have a, a, uh, meaningfully allocated uh, distribution where you're not just uh, throwing mm-hmm. coins away and there's like increasingly effective tools for people to click one button and dump all of them. Um, mm. So yeah, mm. I think uh, proof personhood can do a lot there. Right. It seems like reading between the lines from your answer, Vitalik, that um, mechanisms that can figure out who is creating value for a protocol are going to be really important in a learn to earn type sense where you can be have a continuous token distribution to the people who are adding value to an ecosystem. So basically anything that for a DAO or a learn to earn ecosystem can add value to that ecosystem could then be plugged into a public goods funding mechanism for that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Is, is that accurate? Exactly. Okay. I think so. Cool. So maybe there's a whole category of tools that we'll see uh, that are designed to help figure out who's adding value and measure in, in that in different ways. And I could see a whole bunch of innovation coming out of that. I really hope so. Living a bankless life requires taking control of your own private keys. Not your keys, not your crypto. That's why so many in the bankless nation already have their Ledger hardware wallet. But the Ledger ecosystem is much more than just a secure hardware wallet. Ledger is the combination of the Ledger hardware wallet, the Ledger Live app, and soon the CL Crypto Life card powered by Ledger. The CL card powered by Ledger is a crypto debit card with powerful features like an instant exchange to fiat, where crypto assets are only sold at the moment that you swipe your card, and also credit from crypto collateral where you can collateralize your crypto assets in order to get a higher credit limit. You'll be able to manage your CL card powered by Ledger inside the Ledger Live app, right next to all the DeFi apps and services that you're already used to using, making the Ledger Live app your one-stop shop for all of your financial needs. Go to ledger.com, grab a Ledger, and download Ledger Live to get all of your DeFi applications all in one place. Arbitrum is an Ethereum scaling solution that's going to completely change how we use DeFi and NFTs. Over 250 projects have already deployed on Arbitrum, and Arbitrum's DeFi and NFT ecosystems are growing rapidly. Arbitrum increases Ethereum speed by orders of magnitude for a fraction of the cost of the average gas fee. When interacting with Arbitrum, you can get the performance of a centralized exchange while tapping into Ethereum's level of decentralization and security. If you're a developer who wants low gas fees and instant transactions for your users, visit developer.offchainlabs.com to get started building your application on Arbitrum. If you're a user, keep an eye out for your favorite DeFi apps or NFT projects building on Arbitrum. Many of your favorite apps are already live, with many more coming over soon. You can find these apps at portal.arbitrum.one, and you can bridge your assets over to Arbitrum using bridge.arbitrum.io in order to experience DeFi and NFTs the way it was always meant to be. Fast, cheap, and friction-free. All right, well, I think that we're coming up on the half hour here, so I'm going to get into my closing questions. I, I would love to know if there's anything that I didn't ask you that you want to say about public goods or regenerative crypto economics or uh, that part of the Ethereum ecosystem. Let's see, we talked about NFTs. So we talked about um, humanity gating. And um, oh, um, one other direction um, that I think uh, quadratic funding might need to evolve eventually is that right now, the mechanism doesn't really discriminate much between like people who are part of a commu- of a community and uh, people who are not part of a community. Mm-hmm. Um, and like if um, you make a uh, Gitcoin round for like say 
um, you know, optimism. Um, there's uh, nothing distinguishing, like there's nothing giving in a, an actual member of the optimism community more abil- uh, mm. uh, a greater ability to uh, have an impact on where the matching pool goes than mm. the uh, someone from the Arbitrum community. Mm-hmm. And one way to look at this is um, like, well, well, that like the point is that the mechanism is flat because like mm. it's by being willing to don't to kind of throw money into um, the s- system as a contributor that you are demonstrating that you care about optimism. Mm. The uh, other way of uh, looking about the um, at this uh, though is that um, like in practice and. Um, you know, especially with uh, some uh, some of these per person limits, it is po- like it might be po- it is possible that some of these uh, th- pro- uh, projects end up being uh, vulnerable to uh, brigading. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's esp- like, and this is a problem, especially if like you have funders that like actually actually care, right? Because right. Uh, like quadratic funding, the mechanism was originally designed as this kind of very neutral mechanism that just says fund all fund me all the public goods, mm-hmm. and so. In, from that light, like it makes sense why uh, you uh, ki- um, why uh, you know you want to try to be completely neutral between everything. Mm-hmm. But when you have like f- sources of funding that wants to be more specific, then does it make sense to find a way to try to make the mechanism be more sp- be more um, more specific? Like what would that what would that actually take? Like what would happen right. if um, you know an optimism person um, tries to like sign um, make a uh, or, or let's say any world where um, Gitcoin grants is fully automated, mm-hmm. um, and then someone, an optimism person, um, submits a uh, a, re- a project um, s- applying for funding from the Arbitrum pool, where mm-hmm. that project actually just uh, send, uh, uh, sends the money to uh, do some optimism stuff, and this is transparent and everyone knows about it, mm-hmm. and then they just invite a whole bunch of optimism people to like throw a dollar in and get some and uh, get some of the Arbitrum matching funds, like. How would you actually uh, s- um, prevent that? Like, would it actually would it be some kind of like gated participation mm-hmm. um, thing where if you're not like one of the community members, then either you have like a, a smaller matching allocation or just a, or you just don't get matched? Um, would it be something else? Um, would the uh, matching pool be able to like spec- specify some group participants that have free credits, like? I don't know, but mm-hmm. uh, th- that's just like one of the things that would be yeah, interesting to look at eventually, right? Like this, uh, I think it uh, gets into the broader uh, this uh, question of like we talk how we talk about there is this binary of private and public goods, but right. the reality is that nothing is fully private or fully public. Like mm-hmm. there's medium scale public goods that that right. benefit some people but don't benefit other people, um, and then there's. Uh, People and their and sources of funding that care about some ecosystems and not our other ecosystems, mm-hmm. and how to actually create mechanisms that care about all of those things. Um, it's uh, going to be an interesting challenge, though. I think, but you know, I think it's also a really important one. Right. Well, yeah, I think that's a really important one. As Gitcoin Grants has, uh, we've we've been scaling vertically, which means bigger matching pools. But now we're starting to scale what I call horizontally, which is out into these other ecosystems like Uniswap. Um, and then Polygon, and then we've also been doing cause rounds for climate change and longevity and journalism. And I do think that, uh, you know, being able to figure out whose voice matters within the public goods of each of those ecosystems, now that we're not just having general public goods, is, is, is the problem that I heard back from you. And that's, that's an interesting problem to solve. But I want to tug on the... Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Uh, what I, are we talking on? Yeah, I just wanted to talk on the the sort of like binary between public and private goods. And one of the things that I've been struggling with from a governance perspective is that um, a lot of these projects that are on Gitcoin are public goods in some way or private goods in another way. And I look at these things as maybe a double-sided or triple-sided marketplace in which one side of the marketplace is a public good and the other side of the marketplace is a private good, something that you have to pay for. And, you know, like the example that I would that I would sort of use is, um, you know, I think like ENS, the ability to find anyone out there and like figure out what their ETH address is based off of a name that you can remember, like I'm Milwaukee.eth and being able to find me, that is a public good. But the ability to write to the ENS system costs ETH. And so on that side of the market, it's it's like gated by 
some amount of, of, of money, it's, it is excludable and it is rivalrous. And so I'm wondering, you know, how do you think about that spectrum of pure public goods and private goods? And is there capacity for nuance in how we fund these public goods? And, um, you know, how do you think about that? Is it a binary or is it a spectrum to you? Um, it's definitely a spectrum to me. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, Big yeah, bit. no, I think it's, uh, again, it's definitely a spectrum. Um, I think it's not showing itself as a spectrum yet. Um, and the reason why it's not showing itself as a spectrum yet is because, uh, like the amount of uh, funding to, for, that's, uh, there for public goods, it's still like nowhere near as high as it should be. And mm -hmm. so when the funding is scarce, like it just gets distributed to the things that really, really need it the most, which are these uh, very pure and very uh, underfunded uh, public goods that just have no chance of having a business model otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as the uh, funding increases and as the ecosystem saturates a little more, like I think it fully makes sense for public goods funding mechanisms to also like intervene in uh, places where there are kind of mixed public and private concerns, um, right. right? Like, mm. uh, eventually if, uh, you, know, you know, if like an entire government of like starts uh, running on, uh, on uh, quadratic funding, then, um, you know, maybe like, yes, it should just like give subsidies to businesses who take more effort than others to make sure that their products are environmentally friendly, mm -hmm. um, or, um, you know, to uh, like health insurance companies that like do more to ensure, uh, to ensure that their offerings like are fully universal and open to everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, like that's, you know, like there, like in the real world, there are a lot of like uh, mixed mm -hmm. private and public goods, um, like that. And I think, uh, you know, that's, you know, definitely part of the complexity of the, uh, of the world that we're trying to uh, build for, mm -hmm. which is, which is totally fine. Mm -hmm. So what, what I heard there is maybe a crypto economic incentive for things that you that businesses may have externalized things like environmental impact or access to healthcare to people who are not profitable, um, adding, uh, adding a crypto economic incentive to not externalize those things and to bear those costs and using quadratic funding mechanism as a way of creating that incentive. Did I hear that that correctly? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that we've been talking about in the regenerative crypto economic space is sort of defining an impact DAO as anything that has a net positive impact on the world, um, whether that's a financial, social, or other type of impact on the world. And I'm wondering what you think of that of that definition of like building an. We're, I'm trying. What I'm searching for is an atomic building block of regenerative crypto economics, and the best I've come up on is is one that has a net uh, positive impact and externalizes good for for the world. Um, it. What do you think about that definition? And and can we build a composable building block for more regenerative uh, systems? And, and how would you define it if not? Uh, can we build a yeah, b building block for more regenerative systems? I feel like there's lots of building blocks for more regenerative systems. Like mm -hmm. this is the sort of thing that's like difficult to reduce to one component, right? Because mm -hmm. there's public goods funding and there's different kinds of public goods funding and even different dependencies to public goods funding. Like we talked about like identity, yeah. um, some of the cryptographic aspects, um, there is like decentralized governance. There's this, there's like some kind of arbitration, mm -hmm. um, and all of these systems uh, kind of depend on each other in complicated ways. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, no. So yeah, like, I think there's uh, probably like at least half a dozen building blocks, if uh, if not more. That like if we were yeah. to try to draw out a diagram of all of this, like we, we would see them. Right. Yeah, I was kind of looking for the lowest common denominator, like. For example, with ERC twenty, you can have a token that's a governance token, that's a utility token, that's a security, and ERC twenty is the lowest common denominator. And my attempt at a lowest common denominator for this stuff is impact out is something that has a positive externality, mm -hmm. and that could be implemented. In yeah, ways. Um, I think that's uh, yeah, I think that's uh, so probably the close, uh, closest uh, you can get. It's a, a good place to be. Right. Uh, yeah, okay. I support impact DAOs. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, well, Vitalik, thank you so much for coming on the Regenerative Crypto Economics show and looking forward to seeing you at ETH Denver and through 2022. Thanks so much, Vitalik. Thank you, too.